When did the deep sea become a frontier? What was feared for many centuries as a mysterious realm of sea serpents became, in the early 19th century, a space imagined as static and barren. Empty of currents, empty of temperature changes, empty of nutrient exchanges, empty of life. The Victorian imagination, in step with then nascent scientific archaeology, came to associate the deep with the early history of the planet, as if going deeper meant going back in time. The bottom of the sea was imagined as covered with primeval life forms, or a primordial ooze, which naturalist Thomas Huxley called Bithybius Hackielli, in honor of Ernst Haeckel, the German biologist who had put forward the existence of a protoplasm from which all life had descended. The first oceanographic expedition on the HMS Challenger, however, was later to prove that Huxley's Bithybius was simply an artifact of storing deep-sea mud samples in bottles filled with alcohol, and the goo vanished as an object of study. Starting with the laying of undersea telegraph cables from the late 19th century on, marine science found the recesses of the deep to be full of creatures, anemones, squat lobsters, sea cucumbers, and much else, living in environments as diverse as anything terrestrial. Cold War anti-submarine warfare research disclosed layers of sea life migrating between depths and picked up underwater rumblings that turned out to be volcanic eruptions and sea quakes, often epicentered at mid-ocean ridges where seafloor spreading originates. In 1977, geologists diving in submarines on the undersea Galapagos Ridge in the eastern Pacific Ocean first located hydrothermal vents. Seawater was seeping into the mid-ocean ridge, heating to great temperatures and reacting with magma, exiting vents as plumes of black smoke. Two years later, biologists found a group of organisms adapted to life in the vicinity of such mineral plumes. They found microbes that metabolized using not photosynthesis, but chemosynthesis, the production of organic materials using energy from chemicals, poisonous to most other organisms. In the wake of the discovery of vents, the Victorian idea that the ocean might be home to living fossils was, in a strange way, revived. Vent sites came to be scripted into speculations about life's origin in deep sea volcanoes. These microbes pushed not only at the metabolic limits of life, but also at the very threshold of its beginning. Some scientists and conservationists have cast the seafloor as the last unexplored wilderness. For some, it summons up images of the American West. The challenge of establishing marine protected areas in the high seas is, in many ways, indebted to this frontier narrative. Even at the ocean's deepest point, human-made pollution precedes human exploratory reach. The number of pollutants banned in the 1970s can be found in high concentrations deep in the Mariana Trench. Other forms of pollution from the past are yet to contaminate deep sea ecosystems, such as the fallout of radiation from nuclear testing in the South Pacific. Nowadays, both scientific and popular descriptions of the deep present the ocean realm in its life as an alien other. Perhaps an attempt to gather some of the enthusiasm that space travel conjured in the 20th century for 21st century earthly exploration. 
The deep sea is multiplying biology's knowledge about the possibilities of life, both on Earth and on other planets. The quest for chemical compounds and genes in the bodies of deep sea vent microbes and critters rewrites the ancient life-giving ocean as a techno-scientific frontier to be explored with a can-do commitment to comprehending, taming, and commercializing a vast wilderness.